Movies love playing with audiences' expectations. Directors know what you want to see and often will spend 90 minutes or more hyping up one big moment. However, sometimes that moment, or the money shot as I'm going to refer to it from here on out, is either cut out or purposefully withheld, leaving audiences just kind of scratching their heads. With that in mind then, I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com and these are eight movies that missed out the money shot. Number eight, The Heist, Reservoir Dogs. Now yes, of course, it's the entire point of Reservoir Dogs that you don't actually get to see the heist that the entire rat's nest plot blossoms around. But that doesn't mean that it's not a hugely conspicuous absence nonetheless. Quentin Tarantino has often been accused of self-indulgence and the amount of dialogue that he stuffs into his films, but he also usually balances it with action and copious lashings of hyper-violence. But in stark contrast to his later films, which unflinchingly crowned those violent sequences as the jewels in the story, early Tarantino preferred to instead keep some of his cards hidden. And like I said, it somewhat suits the story, since it means that it's harder to tell what the true story of what went down is, and so we have to follow Mr. White's lack of clarity. It would have been a delightfully Tarantino-esque sequence after all, given the testimonies about it. Number seven, Frank Abagnale's Last Escape. Catch me if you can. Catch Me If You Can is a pretty packed story already, with some of Frank Abagnale's exploits leaving Jaws firmly on the floor. But what if you were to find out that Abagnale's greatest ever moment and his most unbelievable criminal achievement didn't actually make it into the film? Well, you need not wonder on that reality much longer because that is exactly what happened in this film. So, in the real world, after his arrest, somehow Abagnale had his detention commitment papers forgotten and was then mistaken for an undercover prison inspector with all the inherent privileges that come with that. Naturally, he took advantage of this and got an accomplice to pose as his fiance to smuggle him a business card belonging to a so-called Inspector C.W. Dunlap of the Bureau of Prisons that she had stolen. So all Frank had to do from there on out was reveal his undercover secret, show his card, and give the doctored card to his guards as proof of his handler. Then his accomplice would answer and she was able to organize an unsupervised meeting, allowing Abagnale to flee from Washington, where he again evaded escape when he was recognized by claiming to be an FBI agent. So yeah, it's a mad, mad story and surely one that deserved to be in the finished film. Number six, The Kraken's Death, Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Just like we had a little game of imagination in the last entry, this time I want you to imagine a world where a film franchise sets up an absolutely unstoppable force so powerful that it's able to kill the lead character part of the way through his own film series, and then the next time that we see the same deadly force, it's just a corpse washed up on a beach somewhere. Well, that's exactly the sad, frustrating tale of the Kraken from the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, which ended a dead man's chest eating Jack Sparrow and settling his debt to Davy Jones in the process. After we'd watch the beast outmuscle Jaws and take out ships like they were made of twigs on the high sea, its killing of Sparrow was the perfect escalation and confirmation of its threat. This was clearly the real deal, and we had a whole other pirates film to see how the Kraken would be defeated. But then the legendary beast was just sacrificed in order to make the East India Trading Company look more formidable and uncompromising. So the Kraken went from a legendary figure to just an afterthought dumped on a beach, and we didn't get an answer to Dead Man's Chest's most pressing conundrum. Number five, the victory at Orleans, Joan of Arc. Not only did George Millet basically invent special effects and cinema as we know it, just so that someone could eventually get Scary Movie 5 made, hooray I guess, but he also invented intelligent restrained filmmaking as well. In 1900, the grandfather of film made Joan of Arc, shooting over 200 meters of film and 12 different sets, which was a huge amount back then, but even he knew his limits. Thanks to the prohibitive cost then, Millet was forced to leave out one of the single most definitive moments in Joan of Arc's entire life, bar, you know, her death, that being the victory at the Siege of Orleans. Truthfully, the director just realized that he didn't have the space nor the budget to do the battle justice, so he simply left it out. And yeah, this one might have been the better choice, as better to leave us wanting more than to give us an unsatisfying replacement. Number four, the wolf fight, the gray. 
On the surface, The Grail looked as though it was going to be a fairly conventional man versus beast creature film, with a group of survivors relentlessly pursued by a pack of man-eating wolves until a smaller group of them fought back, with Liam Neeson winning the day. In reality though, it's far more of an exercise in philosophical musings and a harrowing experience that builds towards a crescendo that never actually arrives, at least not fully anyway. See, Neeson's casting was very much designed to foreshadow him being the ultimate survivor who would take the fight to the wolves. And then in the final flick, that climactic fight between man and wolf simply didn't happen. We got to see him preparing by making his weapon, yeah, sure. But then the movie cuts to credits and all we see afterwards in the stinger is the sight of the combatants lying in the snow. Number three, taking out the bullet farmer, Mad Max Fury Road. In George Miller's exceptional Mad Max reboot, the titular character is very much a man of few words and lots of action, even when it's sometimes fairly reluctant. If he's forced to do extreme things to save situation, or the wives in his and Furios's protection, he absolutely will, and it'll usually end up being pretty violent. Or at least, that's what you'd expect if you knew the character from the older Mad Max films. In actuality, Fury Road consciously refuses to show Max's biggest opportunity for a violent flourish. When threatened by the bullet farmer when the war rig ends up stuck in the mud, Max takes it upon himself to deal with the threat, taking a knife and a can of fuel and walking towards danger into the fog. But instead of us seeing him take on insurmountable odds, all we get to see is Furiosa watching an explosion in the fog and then seeing Max walk back out of it covered in the blood of his enemies and dragging a haul of weapons. That was Max's big moment and it ends up being completely hidden. Sure, again, the gag works in the context of the movie, but it still does feel like we missed out on a seriously good time. Number two, Cyclops gets obliterated. X-Men 3, The Last Stand. Cyclops may be an enjoyable character in the comics, but in Fox's original X-Men series, he was a little dweeb. Actor James Marsden did do his best with the material, but the writing just wasn't there, and the team's supposed leader was continually sidelined in favor of Wolverine. It's no surprise then that Marsden wasn't too bothered about the role and opted to star in Superman Returns when the opportunity came up. This meant that his character had to be written out of X-Men 3 and thus Cyclops became the first real victim of the Dark Phoenix, AKA Jean Grey. In the movie, when Cyclops sees his presumed dead lover and moves to kiss her, Jean uses her Phoenix powers to obliterate him mid-snog. Sadly, though, the movie cuts away before the actual act, cutting to Cyclops' sunglasses with his body nowhere to be seen. In the context of the movie, it's such a throwaway death the way it's filmed, as it's not even given the grandiosity of happening on screen. Like, come on guys, this could have started the movie off with a bang, but instead it just leaves everyone scratching their heads. Number one, the flag, first man. After breaking the entire world's hearts with the devastating end of La La Land, Damien Chazelle took the next natural step in his A Price of Dreams trilogy, which I have unofficially just titled literally just this second, and managed to upset a smaller but far more vocal group of people. Chazelle's big crime happened when he decided to leave out the American flag planting scene from Neil Armstrong's first walk on the moon. Now, the flag does appear in some shots, but the actual planting of it is omitted as a conscious decision, as Chazelle has explained in interviews, saying, quote, I show the American flag standing on the lunar surface, but the flag being physically planted into the surface is one of several moments that it chose not to focus upon. To address the question of whether this was a political statement, the answer is no. My my goal with this movie was to share with audiences the unseen, unknown aspects of America's mission to the moon." End quote. Now, regardless of the reason, it is pretty obvious that the flag planting is a big money shot of the entire sequence, arguably, and it was one that was intentionally skipped over. So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. What do you think about not getting to see these moments? Do you think it was a missed opportunity or do you think it actually makes the films better, leaving it up to our imagination? Let us know. And while you're down there, could you also please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't thought, I've been Josh. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon.